Hey there, welcome back. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to read another great review we received on Apple Podcasts. The reviewer, not listing their name, is named Seeking Peace, Joy, and Love. So that's pretty much all of us. And they write, Jonathan is not only the author of two great books, Mindful Money and Mindful Investing, he's an extremely talented podcast host. His questions are thoughtful, soulful, and insightful, especially like that middle one. If you're interested in learning how to craft a rich life in every sense of the word, this is a must-listen podcast. So I want to say thank you to Seeking Peace, Joy, and Love. Reviews are incredibly appreciated. They tell the algorithm that we're worth paying attention to. So thank you. If you'd like to leave a review, go to ratethispodcast.com forward slash mindful money and choose your favorite podcast app from the list and go ahead and leave a review. So thank you for that. On this episode of the Mindful Money Podcast, I'm chatting with Jennifer Dazzles. How did I, did I say that wrong? Close enough. It's Dazzles. Dazzles. Okay. Dazzles. Of modern family finance. Jenny comes to the world of yeah. personal finance from 15 plus years in tech, most recently as a director of a Fortune 500 company in Silicon Valley. She is a local Bay Area person. Jenny was named Hero of the 500s by Fortune Magazine for her community contributions. In 2015, Jenny and her wife, Lisa, produced the documentary, the film Out and Around. They travel to 15 countries, interview leaders in the global movement for equality. Their TED Talk, This is What LGBT Life is Like Around the World, has over 3 million views. And Jenny specializes in working with women and LGBTQ plus professionals in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who want to forge their own path in work and life. Jenny, welcome to the Mindful Money Podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. I'm super excited to have you. It's not a topic we've covered. I'm just glad to have somebody from the community actually to chat about it with us and somebody who's got such deep roots. Before we get into that, where do you call home now and where are you connecting from? Actually, I'm currently connecting from Taipei, Taiwan. So we've been somewhat, you could say, digitally nomadic and living an international life for the last eight years, you would say. But I'm actually returning permanently back home to San Francisco Bay Area this summer. Permanently, that's, I mean, is anything ever really permanent? That is know. very true. But that is what I call home. I call San Francisco in the Bay Area my home. So are you coming to San Francisco or? Yes. Some yes. remote, oh, San Francisco. San Francisco. Okay. Yes. Actually, we live in the outer sunset. So oh, beautiful. beautiful. I'm looking forward to be back near the beach. <laughs> Taipei, you're not far from the beach. <laughs> Taipei, yeah, you know, actually, it's not the same kind of beach. Let me just say, we're not a good beach country. Right, right. I kind of start most of these conversations like with childhood. And so what did you learn about money or entrepreneurship when you were growing up? Well, I am a family. I am a child of Asian immigrants, Taiwanese immigrants. So my parents came here for graduate school and I was born here and they raised my brother and I in the States. So, you know, my parents had this mentality of work hard, save money, play it safe. And the teachings that I had around money was that it was important to save. It was important to invest. I still remember my mom telling me a Chinese saying, which is qian gui qian, which is like the translation would be like money rolls into money. And I think that was one of the best teachings, which, it, you know, really taught me to invest. I started my Roth IRA, I think, with the first job that I had when I was 16. But it also taught me to have a scarcity mindset. And I think too much of a focus on money in terms of it being a source of happiness. And so mm. when I came out of college, I was uber focused on just finding a job, you know, that would have the highest income that I could find. And so my first job out of college was actually as an analyst at an investment bank. That was horrible. You know, I spent two years miserable. I just remember walking out and be like, maybe I'm not cut out for this workforce at all. You know, I don't know if I can do this. And I really had a core life crisis at that point and had to reevaluate my values, what was important. And I think that was actually one of the best teachings is just to have that very intense two-year period where, yes, I made money. And actually, more importantly, what I saw was I was surrounded by people who made a lot of money, you know, looking at managing directors, looking at our clients who were entrepreneurs and people who were IPOing their companies and, you know, buying Ferraris and stuff. I realized that, I mean, we all know this, but we don't know this, is that money does not buy happiness and that choosing to choose a job that you don't love is not worth it. So I think that was one of the best, I think, personal learnings of money that I had. Go back to like earlier. So that's like post-college first job. Yes. As a kid growing up, I mean, aside from frugality and you had to save and invest and so you got some of that scarcity mentality, 
Yeah. Can you like name an experience? Your parents are talking about money or you want a thing you can't have, or can you name an experience that sort of contributes to your money story? Well, we always had enough. I was money. I was fortunate to grow up in a financially stable household. So there was never an issue of that. But anything extra that I wanted, I just remember really wanting to buy a pair of jeans and junior high to look like all the other girls, right? Like that stuff I had to earn. And I think for me, that really taught me to value money and to realize that you had to work hard for it. But at the same time, I think that's what also gave me this overemphasis on money as a form of freedom, as a form of status and all these things. I don't know why, but that gene story really emphasized in my head about like my feelings towards money. And I think it's only been in my much later adulthood that I've kind of come to realize like that overemphasis of money is actually not, it's kind of holding me back. And it's important to recognize that I already am free. I already have independence. I don't need to keep accumulating to try to get that. That brings up a, that whole, I already am free. I don't need to keep accumulating. <laughs> that brings up a whole another series of questions, but I'm going to table that for a second. So first job analyst on, for a Wall Street firm or investment bank, right? Yeah. Where does the tech come in? And then how do you get to the advisor world? What's that path okay. look like? Yeah. So I mean, basically I took a year off after like I took, after two years of investment banking, I said, I can't do this anymore. I left and I was just wondering, I really had no idea what I was going to do. I thought, should I go to nonprofits? How do I find more meaning? I went back to live at home. I was in my early 20s. And a lot of things in my life kind of happened during this time too. Also, it's also when I came out as a gay woman. So there was just a lot of identity formation and seeking. But basically, in short, the whole tech thing happened accidentally. Basically, my parents saying, if you don't go get a job soon, we're going to kick you out of the house. So I had a friend. At this point, we were living in the, my parents lived in the East Bay. And I had a friend who worked at tech. And he basically wrote my resume for me, sent it in wrote my cover letter, told me what to do, and I got the job. And I stayed at that company for 15 years. So I was very fortuitous because it put me into a role accidentally. My first role was kind of a strategic internal consulting role that I really enjoyed. And then I was surrounded with really cool people. So I was lucky to land in tech. And then the question as to how I landed in financial planning, basically, as you mentioned in my intro, a couple of years into my tech career, at this point, I had had this like quarter life epiphany and realized that it's important to just live life and do that. So my wife and I, we decided to take, or she was my girlfriend at the time, take a year off from our nine to fives. I took a leave of absence for work and we made this film. And that experience of traveling around the world, doing work that I loved, being with the person I loved, I did not miss work one bit. And all I could think about was, I want to do this again. I want to do this again. I want to, and how do I do this again? I really don't see a path to be able to do this in the corporate settings. So that led me on this whole personal financial planning journey for myself to figure out how to achieve a level of financial independence such that I did not have to depend on that level of income. Because, you know, tech dollars are good and it's hard to replace that, right? So I really was, I guess I got really into the fire or financial independent, you know, what is it? Financial independence, retire early movement. And that's how my interest in personal finance started. I guess you could say it started with my parents teaching me that money rolls into money. And then it really kind of, I got a lit a fire under my butt. I read Vicki Robbins. I read all those books, early retire. What was it? That one guy, Jacob something with, I can't remember the name of his book, but those were life-changing when I realized, wait, I can do this. And so that's how that got me onto this journey. Could it be J.L. Collins, that book, J.L. Collins? I read that book too, but it was another yeah. guy. He was, I can't remember. It's a very, I guess somewhat of an academic book, but it was very, I want to say it's early retire. It's a very boring title, but it, I'll have to find it. I said it over. Yeah. So you started out doing it for yourself. Yeah. And I, I read some of your story. Then other people said, hey, you seem to be doing something right here. Can you show us how to do it? What made you think <laughs> that you could give other people advice on how to do it? <laughs> like that seems to be a stretch from reading a book, doing it for yourself. And then yeah. let me do this for you too. Yeah. I mean, really in the beginning, it was what happened was as I got more and more serious about it, I started telling people about my plan. Like, I want to leave. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And people be like, well, what are you going to do about money? What are you going to do about health insurance? Right. And I'm like, well, this is my plan. These are the things that I read. Right. So that's how those conversations began. And at, in the beginning, it was just very casual conversations. You know, it was like if one friend who was getting married and said, hey, you know, you're really good at money. Can you help me and my partner figure this stuff out. So it was kind of like that. And then 
as I started nearing my point in which I was going to jump off of my career, of my corporate career, I started really thinking about what did I want to do next? And I realized like it wasn't that I wanted to do nothing next. I still, I wanted to work. I wanted to contribute. I wanted to do something. And I thought, let me just experiment. So I started doing some coaching with just a little money involved. You know, there was a small fee, but I just wanted to see if I can do it for real. And that was the beginning of my journey into making this a profession. So you read a lot of fire stuff and then you start giving advice. And now you're a CFP, you know, you're active in the financial planning world, you're members of NAPFA and all the different FPA and all these kind of stuff. What do you think the difference is between somebody that reads the fire books? There's a lot of great books. Jail Collins, one yeah. of them, I've written a couple of them. There's just a bunch of really good books out there people can learn about. But what's yeah. the difference in terms of your knowledge base now that you've actually been trained to do it professionally? Do you see a big difference or do you think, or do you ever tell somebody, hey, what? yeah, you can do this yourself. Why do you need somebody like me? Yeah, well, I think there's two questions there. So one, I want to clarify before I gave real advice, like I gave casual advice to friends, right? In the same way we might give romantic advice, right? But actually giving professional advice at that point, I was going through the education process. And then to be a professional, I did go through the full CFP program and pass the board. So I wasn't giving willy nilly advice. But yeah, I do think there's a difference. And I think even, you know, entering the profession, I knew, you know, when I first started, I was working under another advisor just as a mentorship and learning. And I realized, wow, there's a lot to learn from people who are doing this professionally, just because I think the biggest thing is you're only a sample case of one, right, for when you're doing finance for yourself. So there's a lot of different people with different, both financial circumstances, but also money behaviors and money beliefs. So how do you actually help people that kind of are not basically a replica of you? So I do think that the CFP education gives you a good basis for all of that. At the end of the day, it's conversations and you learn and sometimes you make mistakes and, you know, you have to be humble. But I think more than that, the actual practicing of this, the biggest learning has been learning how to talk to people, how to listen, how to be a coach. You know, the technical piece. Yeah, there's tons of information out there. There's most answers that any CIP can give. You could probably Google it. But how do you know what's relevant to you? And then how do you actually receive it in a way that you can take action? That's really the hard part. It's like health. You can read everything you need to know about health, but then actually doing something about it is a whole different answer and knowing what it applies to you. So that answer is why, and I knew you would answer it kind of that way. It's about coaching. It's not about, I have a special knowledge no one else can have. The information yeah. is out there, but yeah. it's how do you help people make decisions that they're not comfortable taking on their own. They need to have someone hold their hand sometimes. Tell them when it's a bad idea because, you know, we get enamored of our own thoughts sometimes. Yeah. So I'm going to ask this question. I kind of know what the answer is going to be, but what is kind of the special knowledge or ability that makes a good advisor? What is it that makes somebody a really good advisor? Well, I mean, assuming that you have the basic knowledge, right? You're a good technical advisor and you know all that. I think that special knowledge is different for each person. I think it's what makes me special relative to you as an advisor. It's what we're bringing to bear from our own personal experience and the way that we particularly interact with people and that is special, unique to us. And that is why I think it's like when I market myself, like there's so many people out there, there's so many advisors. We, I mean, if you look at websites of financial advisors, they all kind of say the same thing, right? So what makes me different or what makes you different from any other advisor it's about who we are as a person and how we connect with that person, uh, the other person, right? The client itself. So I think that like what makes you special is the personal experience and the way that you can help people. I know that might not actually be the answer that you thought I was going to say, but I think that's what makes us unique. And that's actually why I work with women and LGBTQ people, because I think that's what they're looking for. They could find similar advice from 20 other advisors, but why do they choose to work with me? Because of who I am and because of my personal experience. That's why, you know, why would they work, choose to work with you or anybody else? And I think that part is super important because working with an advisor is very intimate. You know, it is a very personal journey. And so you need to find somebody that you can trust, that you might feel like you have some commonality with. And I think that's particularly important for my target client base. So I'm going to ask the question a little bit different way because I totally agree with everything you just said. And <laughs> it's a great way to answer the question. But I, I want to generalize across you, across me, across all the other really good advisors out there, Plato's forms, the concept of there are lots of different kinds of tables, but there's mm -hmm. some very few basic things that make it a table, you know, four legs, flat top. So the tableness, 
what is the skill set? And I think you kind of referred to it a little bit earlier. What's the skill set that really makes an advisor a good advisor? We have to be able to tell a unique story and attract yeah. a unique relationship. What is that really maybe soft skill set or soft skills that advisors have that make them great advisors? Not good advisors, but great advisors. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a good advisor is someone who helps the client feel like they understand their life priorities and their values and that their money is aligned to it. And so practically speaking, how does that happen, right? I think a good advisor is really starting with, you know, usually the person is coming with some very specific issues, but those issues, you know, maybe it's like, what should I do in my 401k rollover? Or how should I invest X, Y, Z? Or whatever that might be. But that's really just one technical piece in the context of their overall, what they want out of their life, right? At the end of the day, it's not about solving the 401k rollover. It's about solving how do I make sure that I can fund my most important financial goals? And by the way, what are even my most important financial goals? So I think a good advisor is helping them tease that out because it's not, most people don't come in with a list of five goals, prioritize it, how much they cost, right? So that's like kind of step <laughs> number one. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well, how do we come up with a plan to do that? And then thirdly, understanding that that plan will immediately change and being able to iterate and do that. And then I think fourthly, that's where the soft skill comes in is kind of working with that person. And there's many different ways to implement a plan, right? Like there's no one right way. And there's also a, a kind of a wide parameter of what's okay financially, right? There's some clear wrong answers, but there's a lot of different ways you can do something. So it's helping to figure out for that client what makes the most sense for their personality and also their situation and risk flow. Beautifully answered. So is there anyone that comes into your office and like, I kind of need this help, but I've read this book and that you just say, you know what, you don't really need me. Is there anyone that's, they sort of have these capacities in themselves? And do you ever turn people away because, hey, they can do it themselves? Yeah. I mean, I think if someone is coming out into my office, or I guess they'll say my virtual office, they have this inkling that maybe they could use some help, right? Or they wouldn't even reach out. There are some people I've talked with who are strong DIYers, right? They come in with spreadsheets from Tiller and they do all yep. this stuff, right? And they have to. <laughs> they already, they actually come with their list of like five goals and how much they cost, right? And I think what I do with all of my discovery calls is just try to really understand what their core problems are. I, I ask the magic wand question is like, where would you want to be in a year or two years if you could just wave a magic wand and see, kind of help them pretty much talk themselves into, do you, do you think you have the capacity to get from where you want to be to where you want to go? And what are the roadblocks, right? What are the roadblocks that you see from you getting there to there? And in the roadblock, the question is like, can they solve the roadblock by themselves, right? right? I think at the end of the day, it's never that I tell someone you don't need help. It's more that maybe I'm not the right help. There's many different ways people can get help. They might could just use a financial coach. They could just use maybe some short-term work. But even in this Tiller example, I recently just signed on someone. This He came with a Tiller spreadsheet and he was very much DIYer. At the end of the day, my saying to him was like, you could do a lot of this work yourself. But it sounds like what you're really looking for is a sounding board, especially in the context of money with your partner, right? Because a lot of times what you're doing is holding space for a couple to be able to speak and talk about these things that they're unable to do on their own. And so that's what I think the main value of my work, that's why he chose to hire me is because of that capacity. So I think people hire you for different reasons. Are there character traits of people that you think they really probably should have an advisor? I mean, you just mentioned one, partners that disagree on stuff. That's a, yes. I mean- that's absolutely true. How do you get a partner, two partners to agree on something? Well, yeah. you need a third party. So is there anything that's like really, that stands out in people that hire you as a character trait that they really benefit from the help of an advisor? Well, I mean, I think one of them is like, if there's some event that's complicated or something, a big change in your life, right? That could be getting buried, that could be getting divorced, that could be coming upon inheritance, that could be receiving a large equity uh, lump sum because your company went IPO, whatever that is, right? So I should say there's a technical issue there. There's also a mindset issue shift, right? You're going from managing your money as a single person to a couple. That's a big shift. You're going from having very little money to have a ton of money, right? That's a really big shift. So I think having somebody to help you through that, it can be very helpful. The other second aspect is for folks, and I end up with a lot of this, and I think I myself really understood the value of financial planning when I was a tech employee through this process too. So you try to do it yourself and it's just like, you don't have time. You, you, don't, you know what I mean? Like you don't have time and you make mistakes and you've made mistakes and they've come at having made some, some mistakes and they realize like, you know, at the end of the day, sure, they can do parts of this stuff themselves, but the value of 
their time, their energy, and the cost of making a mistake, like, is it worth it? And can I just have somebody be on my team, right? Like, I really kind of talk to clients and say, look, what you're hiring is not somebody, this is not a transaction, right? What I'm not looking for is a transaction. What I'm looking for is a transformation to get you from a place of financial uncertainty or anxiety to a place of financial confidence. That's what I'm trying to help you do. So that's what I think. People who want that, people who think having a third party to help do that is valuable, I think they would benefit from an advisor. Yeah, for sure. It seems a lot of your work is, especially post-tech, is sort of mission-driven. Can you tell us the mission of modern family finance? Yeah, you know, the mission here is I really want people to go from seeing money as a constraint on their life, because typically you think, well, what can I do? Depends on how much money I have, right? To seeing money as a fuel for their best life, right? It's actually what kind of life do you want and how do I use my money to support that? That's actually a very different way of thinking about money. And there's the reality of money. It's not like I can wave a magic wand and all of a sudden everybody that I work with has $5 million. There are real constraints. But at the end of the day, it is, there's the technical work and there's a mindset work around money. I've seen people with very little money, but feel very free and people with lots of it and still feel very constrained, right? So that's my mission. And I think because of who I am, I think I'm uniquely positioned to help the target audience that I am, I work with, which is primarily tech or self-employed folks who really want to create their own path, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they want to jump off their careers and do something different like I did, but it just means like they want to live their life outside the box. They don't want a traditional kind of nine to five work till I'm 65 kind of thing. And how do I do that? So what's the, how do you define modern family? It's as you want to define it. I think we use that word to make it more inclusive, right? Because I don't just work with LGBTQ people, but I'd say my primary audience ends up being single women or LGBTQ people. It's just what happens to find me. I think the single woman thing happened because I think that's particularly when you ask who would benefit from my advisor, I think a single person particularly because they don't have that other partner to bounce off of. And it, you can't really just ask a casual friend, what should I do? Right? Like money is a very intimate thing often. So yeah, I think a modern family is as you wish it to be. I mean, we tend to be people who come to me, they're progressive. They fall into these kind of, I guess, demographics just by nature of they read my website and you can either be attracted or repelled by me. So that's my goal <laughs> with the website. <laughs> that is what a website's for. What are the special concerns of the modern family, the LGBTQ plus families? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there is a couple of things. I think at the, of course, we can talk about kind of there's the higher cost of family forming, right? My family, we have two kids. Yep. We did this through IVF. We work with other gay couples who adopt and whatnot. So this is an extra cost there. You may have higher medical bills or whatnot. If you've had my trans clients, that's an issue for them. I think one of the biggest things that we don't define our relationships, often they're different. You know, you have people who have maybe just different types of relationships, whether it's I primarily am single, but, you know, like, and how does that translate to how they think about money? Is it with the partner? Do they want to think independently? And then how does that translate also into financial planning as it relates to estate planning or who owns what and how do you split the money? Another big one is aging. You have families, many families who don't have children, right? So how do you think about making sure, especially couples or people that I work with, LGBTQ people in their 50s, a lot of them don't have kids. So thinking about aging as a single person. And then lastly, I think one that doesn't get talked to about enough is that for LGBTQ people, it's where we live. There's sometimes we'll choose to live in two high cost of areas, but that's because, so we choose to live in the SF Bay Area, despite how expensive it is, because it's where our friend base is, where we feel safe. It's where we feel like we can just fully be ourselves in a full way, right? Versus having the option to be like, well, why don't you just move to X, Y, Z town? Well, that's great. There's this whole migration out to the rural areas, right? But it's like, I don't feel comfortable there, right? So I think that's also a consideration too. I mean, I think these, the issues haven't really changed. Some of the legal stuff around it's changed. The safety mm -hmm. you know, feeling probably hasn't changed much. But do you think this is changing over like the next decade, 20 years? Do you think that things are improving or do you feel like a little bit of a backlash against it still? I mean, I feel hopeful, right? I mean, I guess I consider myself That's an a very good answer. After us, yes. a very good answer. I, it's amazing how much has changed just even in my lifetime or our lifetime, right? And yeah. so I feel fortunate. You know, I have also, but it's still a, for us, it's still a concern about where we live. So we live in Taipei now because it's the only place in Asia that has marriage equality, right? So I wouldn't go live in certain places in Asia because of that. 
we lived in Western Europe, but would I go live in Eastern Europe? You know what I mean? Like there's still places I would choose not to, I would not even consider living in because I would not feel safe. So there's definitely still work to be done. No doubt. Okay. So I want to ask a couple of circle of competence questions. And <laughs> the first test. is most people come to you with an issue. Do you see, if there's a bell curve of issues, do you see most people have this specific issue or a general issue. For me, it's always been retirement planning, but when yeah. they come to you, what is it they're looking for? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's different depending on who you work with. So my clients are not retirees. They're in mid-career folks who usually have a pretty good income. So they're 30s to 50s with decent professional careers. So their question is typically, okay, I make enough money to support my life now, but what if I want to stop? That's often the question that's unsaid, but that is what they're coming to, right? Like, and how do I know that I'm doing all the right things to make sure that my, fi my future is going to be taken care of when I stop making all these oodles of income from my nice tech company, right? So that's typically the question on their mind. And when it comes down to like, technically speaking, it is, it still boils down to the same topics that I'm sure all advisors deal with, whether it's cash flow, tax planning, savings, I guess in our, my case is often equity compensation planning as well but they just look a little bit different because of the people I'm dealing with. So there's a fair amount of tax planning there because usually these folks are in the higher brackets. So we are trying to figure out what we can do around there. And then I think equity compensation is interesting too, because there's a lot that you can do around there. And there's also a lot of emotion because people are very attached often to their company equity. So a lot of the work I do is just helping to come up with an objective plan around that. I think that's where a third party, having a professional third party, a trusted expert can help. I did this in the late nineties where it was like the dot com boom. So that was yeah. everyone thought their company was the company. I'm like, yes. there's hundreds of the companies, yes. so stop it. Yes. Is there anyone that comes to your office that's asking for something that you can't do? And I have this yes. experience in terms of like, Jonathan, I need you to I'd like you if you could beat the S P five hundred every year. Like that kind of thing. Does that come up for you or anything like that come up for you? Yeah, I try to be quite clear on my website about my investment philosophy. So I don't have too many people who come in asking to beat the S P five hundred. They generally already like understand that trying to time the market and trying to game that is very difficult. I tell them off the bat that, look, I'm not a stock picker. That's not what we're trying to do here. My goal with your investments is to maximize the certainty that you can reach your financial goals. That is my goal. So I do have some folks who want to say, well, can I compare how you do to my 401k and let's just see how it goes in half a year. I say, look, if that's what you want to do, I don't think you should hire me, you know, because that's not actually the point of the work that we're doing together. Right. I do have people come in a lot who say like, I don't know if I have enough to hire a financial plan. I don't know if I have assets. I don't know if it's worthwhile. So, and sometimes the answer isn't always yes. So it, it depends, but yeah, but I'll have clients who might not have a ton of net worth, who might not have a lot of assets right now, wondering if they need to hire an advisor and wondering what's worth the fee. And I say, look, it's not about, I don't have a fee asset minimum. The question is, do you think the value of our work together is above and beyond the fee that you're paying? That's what it is in terms of both the return that you can, and that might come in tax planning return, but also like the time that you save, the peace of mind that you feel, the confidence that you feel towards having the plan. Yeah. yeah. This all sounds very familiar. So there's an enormous amount of like of noise out there and there's all the books yeah. and there's the blog, but there's also yeah. CNBCs and news sources and things like that. So I really want you to simplify something for us. So let's just pretend like you're on a cross country flight or maybe you're on, you're on the flight back from, from home to home. If you met someone on that, I guess, global flight, and they started to pick your brain and you thought they'd really benefit from working with an advisor. What is one thing that they should do right out of the gate that would give them better outcomes? What you, one basic financial tip? Yeah. But just like the first thing, like not, it doesn't have to be invest in XYZ. It could be just, what is it they need to understand or do first? Well, I say it always starts with cash flow, right? It doesn't matter how much you make. I think what first thing is just to understand where your money is going. And because at the end of the day, if you're a working person, your most important asset is that income that's coming in, right? If you're a retiree, it's different. It's what's going on with your nest egg right now. But it's where is that money that's coming in and where is that going to? And I think that kind of can drive the conversation everywhere else. So one of the first thing I would do is get a handle on where your money is going. How much of it is, one of the things I do for my clients is the first thing we do is just like a bubble chart. 
you have this much coming in, how much is going to taxes, how much is going to savings, and how much is going to your spending. And within that spending, how much is going to say mortgage and fix things and discretionary things. Just seeing that picture is usually really eye-opening to people. One, in terms of their savings rate, right? Like, is that again, and the benchmark that I typically throw out there for folks that I work with is, look, you're trying to get to at least 20% of your gross income. That's my goal for most of my clients, right? Which is not, it's a fairly ambitious goal for some people. And so let's see, where are you with that, right? And then also, how much is going to taxes can be quite enlightening to people too. <laughs> Understanding, like, is there anything that you can do to help mitigate that? Where you're saving, are you using the best channels? I think a lot of the folks that I work with, they have access sometimes to these after-tax 401ks or the mega backdoor Roth. If you have enough cash flow, that could be a great way to take advantage of to goose up your tax-efficient savings, right? And then your spending, that's the biggest black box for people. People have no idea. But if you actually can figure out those other things, the remaining is going to spending. And then almost everybody is appalled and shocked by how much they're spending. I say, look, we're not trying to minimize your spend here. We are trying to maximize your joy for your present now and your present person and your future person, right? So that's the balance. So I'd say like the first thing is really starting with the cash flow and that can branch out into many other conversations. Love it. That's great. And then there's, what is this, the sort of follow-up to this is what is one thing that maybe they think they're supposed to do or that they're worrying about that the world tells them they've got to think about, but you're just like, just don't worry about that. Ignore that for now. Yeah, I'd say it's like fancy investing, right? Like, should I be bought, like, I don't know, some private real estate deal or should I do some VC stuff or angel investing? If you find that to be fun, sure. I occasionally have clients who come to me and they're like, well, there's this kind of opportunity to invest in XYZ. Should I do this, especially in tech, right? If it's fun and if it's a small percentage and there's kind of like we're risk managing it, that's one thing. But if your goal is like, I'm trying to build my wealth, at the end of the day, like, I think the biggest thing that financial media is trying to make you believe is that complexity is actually going to drive better results. And that is absolutely 100% not true, right? So complexity does not drive bigger results. In fact, most of the time, it's going to make your results worse. So that's what I would say. It reduces the probability of good yes. outcomes. Yes. It reduces yeah. the probability of good outcomes, for sure. <laughs> we have so many things that are aligned. I hope that when you get back to the Bay Area, we can go grab coffee or something. Yes, that. yes that'd be great. Right yeah. along. I'm in Berkeley, so right across the Okay, great. Yeah. Two questions just on a very personal note. What was the yeah. last thing you changed your mind about? What was the last thing I changed my mind about? Well, it could be anything in life. Anything. It could be what okay. you have for breakfast. I was going to have a sandwich. I decided okay. to have a bagel. Okay. Well, right. actually, uh, it's actually about food, right? So actually for, I don't know, I'd say the last four or five years, our household has, and with it was my wife, have been largely vegetarian. And so one of the things that I've recently started doing is introducing meat back into my diet. I still eat a lot less meat than I used to. But one of the things just kind of as I've been reading about women aging and all this kind of stuff is the importance of protein and just all these different amino acids. And so just introducing some of that back into my diet. That's been a big thing that has been that I've changed in my life, in my mind. That's great. I've done that a few <laughs> times. It's good. Yeah. If you could get the second thing is if you could get the truth about any single question about your life or your future, and all you had to do was ask, what would you ask? Oh, man. See, now you're going to know the true planner of me. I told someone the whole time, I want to know when I'm going to die. I want to know the age I'm going to die because then I could plan around it. But that's me, that's right. right? Like my wife absolutely does not want to know that answer. She's like, why would you want to know that? I'm like, well, then. I can really know, right? Like both financially, personally, like that I would know. It's like, this is very bothering to me that I have to plan for longevity when I don't know. I, although I told her, I said, one of the things I'll be so pissed is if I die early and I didn't get to like, you know, like I wanted to sometimes kind of spend everything, right? So that's what I'd want to know. How about you? I sort of agree. So I could prepare. I'm a planner too. I want to be able yeah. to prepare. Yeah. I want to make sure all the ducks are in a row. Something happens yes. to me. My kids are set up. Everything's, yeah. you know, everything's aligned. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good one. So Jenny, tell people how they can connect with you, where they find you on the web. Yeah, so you can find me by going to modernfamilyfinance.com. That's where all my information is. So that's the best place to go. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. We're going to make sure everything's in the show notes. If you do think about the book we were stumbled on earlier, send me a, a, the name of the book and I'll include that in the show notes as well. But I really appreciate you coming on. I'm glad you're here to sort of talk to folks everywhere about the best ways to plan their financial futures. Great. Well, thank you so much. This is really fun.